Oh, that's confusing. So here we go. And yeah. Right. Welcome everyone to our first talks of PyCon twenty sixteen. Uh, in our first session, we'll be having uh, Christian Hymas, who is a longtime core developer of CPython and an employee of Red Hat, and he'll be telling us about file descriptors, Unix sockets, and other POSIX magic. So please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Welcome to PyCon, and welcome to my talk. This is actually the first time I'm talking in English in front of a public audience, so excuse me if my English is not that perfect, but yeah. So let's go, let's go on. I'm working for over a year for Red Hat uh, as a senior software engineer in security and identity management department. So we are developing software to make computers more secure. And one of the things I'm currently doing research on uh, is called Custodia. It's a way to get secrets like passwords and AP keys into containers to make that more secure. And this actually uses lots of the things I'm going to explain in the next 25 minutes. Because I've just have 25 minutes, unfortunately, I can't give you ready-to-use receipts. I'm going to introduce you to a couple of concepts, a couple of tools you can use in your application. Most of the stuff I'm going to explain is focused on Linux and works only on Unix-like operating systems, so POSIX. And all the examples, of course, are in Python 3. Yeah, nobody uses Python 2 anymore, hopefully. <laughs> so, uh, agenda for today, I'm going to explain file, file descriptors, and later on a bit into the operating system and the Linux kernel. And next up are how file descriptors and processes interact with each other, which is each other. Uh, a bit about networking, and finally, Unix sockets, containers, sandboxing. And depending on how I'm, fast, uh, I'm able to talk today, I have a little bonus track. So, simplifications ahead. Sorry, I have to lie in a couple of places just because I don't have the time to get in all details. I'm going to skip over a couple of parts. If you want to know more, I'm going to have an open space later on today at 4 o'clock. So, file descriptors. Maybe you have the term in Unix, everything's a file. So, like the dev file system, the proc file system, uh, you can use just to integrate with your hardware or to get information of processes, networking, settings, et cetera, et cetera. And everything you do with that, every time you do input, output, read some stuff, write some stuff, even interact with uh, resources, use a file descriptor. File descriptors are used for all sorts of stuff, things like reading, writing files, obviously, even directories. We can interact with hardware. Uh, we do inter-process communications, like we talk between processes, networking, I.O. multiplexing, but the heart of async I.O., file system monitoring, and lots of stuff more. File descriptor is internally a bit like a ticket. So you go to the kernel, you ask the kernel for access to a resource, you get back a ticket, and every time you want to do something with the file descriptor, uh, with this resource, you show the kernel again the file descriptor, it has a number, like a ticket, and the kernel does something. Yeah. There are a couple of standard numbers, 0, 1, and 2 for 
uh, standard in, standard out, and standard error output. There's also number one reuse for error indication. Don't care about it in Python. Yeah, Python is an exception for you. So you see developer, you have to take care of minus one in Python, no. Very simple example, probably seen that with statement, open a file, read from the file, print it. This example uses already two file descriptors once the process is running. So it reads from a file, the open creates a file descriptor, and the print writes to another file descriptor, yeah, send it out, so into the shell. That's a very simple example for a file descriptor. You can do even more with file descriptors. You can use file descriptors to actually reference a file that's already open. It's rather useful in sort of cases. It has also security uh, implications. That's usually more secure. If you already have a file open, you can get the status information of a file. You can change the uh, file permission settings. So, uh, a couple of years ago, um, Python were able to use the dir file descriptor. So you can use a file descriptor to a directory like a location indicator. Um, the we use the modern Python, Python um, I think 3.4 introduced that feature. Um, yeah. Then you can even control your hardware with a file descriptor. And that's my only demo for today. I hope it works. <laughs> so, um, did you hear that? So, for those who are hearing impaired, so we have closed caption. Um, oh, wrong one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hi there. So, that's what happens. Uh, Pre-recording, so. Uh, actually, I use the file descriptor to open um, some hardware device, dev cd rom and uh, give it a command to eject the bay. And back on. It works only on Linux at the way, so every operating system has their own like of magic codes for that. So, operating system 1.1. So, before I can teach you some of the more elaborate tricks, I have to explain how operating system actually works internally. We used to have the dark ages back then. We had no kind of isolation between processes. Everybody could just read and write from hardware, from sockets. When one program crashes, it could just tear down the whole system. Yeah, if you use DOS like me in the old ages or even older computers, uh, crash of a program usually means you have to restart the computer. In all modern operating systems, we have a layer between the hardware and the software called the kernel. The kernel uh, does a lot of things. Um, I'm not going to explain all the hardware drivers, the, um, the way the kernel makes it much easier to talk to hardware, rather than the kernel is also a very important step to isolate processes. So a process can't directly interact with another process except of using the kernel in one way or another, at least to set up a communication channel. The kernel also does lots of checks regarding security. So you have file permissions, you have users and groups in your system. For networking, you have maybe firewalls. Um, you have physical memory in your computer and you have visual memory in the processes and how the kernel map leads visual memory to physical memory. It's something I wanted to explain, but unfortunately, eh, not the time today. 25 minutes is very short. So, to sum that up, uh, every time you do something, you have to talk to the kernel. If you read or write. The way you talk to the kernel is called a syscall. It's a system call. Um, that's the step where you switch the context from a user space program to a kernel space program. Maybe you have the term heard context switch. Um, context switches are rather slow, take a couple of, up to a couple of hundred CPU cycles on a modern system. And Linux has a lot of them, like currently almost 400s. And we go back to the simple example, where you just open the file, read from the file, and print it out. Um, there's a command called sysTrace or strace, where you can see which kind of, um, system calls the program does. So in this example, uh, 
the with statement opens the file, and you get follow script to number three. So the kernel usually takes the next open follow script error. And then Python does some stuff like check it's actually a real file to prevent you from opening file, uh, opening directories in a way. It seeks to the first uh, position of the file in case something is, yeah, I don't know why really. Benjamin might know. He wrote that. <laughs> and then we use again number three to read and read a couple of strings. Uh, the number 19 at the end means it actually wrote, uh, read 19 characters from the string. Tries again, okay, file is empty. And then Python uses another file script, number one, that's the standard out, to actually write the string to the shell. And finally, every time we have a file descriptor, we should close the file descriptor because file descriptors are actually very scarce resources. So you don't want to waste them. We have a long running program run out of, a f um, out of a file descriptors. Yeah, you can't do anything anymore. Um, the kernel internally maintains a couple of tables, information. We have the global open file table. That's one gigantic table in the kernel that has all open resources. Every process has a file descriptor itself, a file descriptor table itself. This file descriptor table in the process is actually very small. It just maps and this one of the numbers into the kernel. So a couple of examples. So you open a file, you get a file descriptor that points to an entry in the global table and eventually ends up like in a file. You can open the same file again, get an independent file descriptor but you can also duplicate the file descriptor, and now you get the file descriptor that it points to the same entry. And there's another operation that's useful, we're going to get that later. We can um, overwrite a file descriptor and uh, can rename it. And finally, there's a way to get a file descriptor to another process, uh, so that suddenly another process is, uses the same global entry. Um, in this table, um, the, the file descriptor table itself just contains this mapping, another flag, close, close exec, or close exec, I'm going to explain in a couple of minutes. And the open file table actually contains everything that's stateful, like the position of the file, the mode, if you read the file, uh, open the file, read or write, or both, who's the owner, file locking, credentials, reference counting, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the entry in the open file table, the global table, it's a bit like this old device. So you have a global counter, and even if you have multiple programs reading from uh, the same resource, you can't go independent. Next up, um, how Unix creates processes. That's a bit strange for people that are not used to that. So um, there are actually two steps in creating a new process. For one, we have fork. Fork just creates a clone of the current process and uh, basically a almost perfect copy except for threading. And this child process you create inherits this file descriptor table from the parent process. So it actually points to the same global entry. And the second step you do, oh no, sorry, first thing, small example. So if you run fork, um, then the, the first process you might have, like that's currently the, uh, the parent process, just by, happen to be the first that uh, the print from a parent process that reads a bit of, uh, from the example txt Python, and uh, almost at the same moment, the child process reads from the same file descriptor in the global table, just to get to the end. So, the second step we have, um, just forking a process, getting a copy is not very useful if you want to run a different program. The second step is replacing the current code with different code, and that's called exec. Um, even in exec, you get all the file descriptor from the original process, which can be a security issue. That's where clo exec comes in. So all file descriptors marked as clo exec are automatically closed. And thanks to Victor Stinner and Python, you have to, don't have to care about that too. So, quick summary: every time you do something, if you go to the kernel, we have this different kind of 
tables, and a new process is created with fork and exec. Now you might wonder, why is this useful? The child process actually get the same file script as the parent process. This better something like subprocess pipe or like piping on a shell comes in. Pipe is actually really like a, a water pipe. You have one end where the data flows in and another end where the data flows out. It's in unidirectional pipe. And uh, the way this piping works is you have a comma like OS pipe, Python center library is very awesome, where you get two ends. And um, when a subprocess module uh, creates a new process, it first forks itself, uh, then checks, oh, it's a parent process, we're not interested to use the right end, we just close it and degroup with that. And in the child process, we close the read end, because the child is not supposed to mess with both ends. And then we use step two, that's the rename the file descriptor to number one. And lastly, we run a program like ls. And the, then the parent person itself can read again from the file descriptor and that's how piping works in subprocess. But of course, just talking between processes is not very interesting. You want to talk in this global world to other computers. Now we have network sockets. Network sockets are a bit like a parcel delivery system, a sorting center. We send packages through a couple of steps. That's where routing and addressing comes in. So in order to send a package from you to somebody else, you need to know the address. And the other person you send the package to, of course, needs to know to, uh, to whom sent back an answer. So a bit like a letter. And these addressing routing, um, just IP44 and IP46. So the basic internet protocols most of you probably heard of. And there's also a second uh, thing called flow control. It's like, do you want to send just out packages or do you want to send out packages and get a receipt if the package was actually received by the other peer? That's TCP and UDP. So, quick example. So, that's how our uh, server, uh, Unix server looks like for a socket service. So, you bind to a port like, like an address, like a street address, an apartment number. You listen to wait for incoming packages, and then you finally accept packages. And both the server and the, the con, the connection, are uh, file descriptors internally. And the client itself also creates a new socket and connects to the peer to send them. And what probably not everybody knows, um, IP44 and IP46 are uh, incompatible. So you have to use a different kind of addressing and different, yeah, kind of address names. Now to the promised Unix sockets. Unix sockets are uh, a bit like a mix of pipes and um, network sockets. So actually they are net network sockets but limited. So they only work on the current computer. It's, yeah. A bit like an old style pneumatic delivery system uh, where you have pipes running through your building, like building the, this example is like your operating system, and to connect different parts like processes. Because it's all in house, so inside one kernel, we have additional features and additional security settings. And the kernel guarantees that these pipes are protected and nobody can mess with them, with them. And to send a message, you have this line of fancy printed capsule where you put your data in, but you can also put some information outside. You can glue a tag on it, and um, that's called ancillary data for Unix sockets. So Unix sockets, like a way to create Unix sockets is you just exchange the um, way you do the addressing. So instead of uh, talking to IP46 or IP44, you use a Unix, a REST family Unix, and then you can use a path to a file as like a location, and the client can then connect to that file. 
because these are regular files in the file system, you can use all sorts of permission settings, like uh, the way you have user and groups and read and write bits. So you can use that feature for authentication and for protecting. There are also a way to create a socket pair that's a bit like a pipe but with uh, bidirectional ends. And there are Unix has, uh, Unix has also something called abstract namespace. Can, not going to cover that here. So a couple of things we can actually do with Unix sockets that don't work with normal sockets. We can get the peer credentials. So the kernel tells us who's on the other side of the pipe. Um, a bit of example, it's currently not in the standard library. I'm planning to add that for Python 3.6. You can get the, the PID, the program ID, the process ID, the user ID, and the uh, group ID of another process. We call that's guaranteed by the kernel. The kernel, the, nobody can mess with that. You can also get, if you're running a system that has SLinux, you can get the SLinux context. Again, I'm going to add that feature to the standard library too. Um, And we can use both these features to do something very fancy with containers. That's one of the main things I'm using for the custodial protocol, is we can use Unix sockets even between containers, because they actually run the certain kernels, kernel space. They're not like virtual machines. As a Linux might make it a bit harder for very good reasons. Um, then Walsh has a couple of blog posts about SLinux on uh, Unix containers. Um, another thing, so when you run a container, you have different namespaces, so the container doesn't see other processes. But with the Unix sockets, actually the kernel translates the PID to the correct... Later. Okay. Um, and you also get this multi category security separation label. Uh, so every container is guaranteed to have a unique label. Every currently running container has a unique label for SE Linux systems if you use uh, secure virtualization. So, what's that useful? We can actually get the Docker ID from a PID. So we have like the C groups file, the control groups. You look on the control groups file, looks a bit like that shorten the ID a bit, and this beginning of the hash, that's actually the Yudoka ID. And um, when you look closer, you can um, check if the SLinux label matches, and if you're running like Kubernetes or OpenShift, you can even get to the uh, information of the container pod namespace, and yeah. And because that's, um, the kernel uh, prevents any process from messing with that unless either the kernel or the Docker container is, uh, if both the kernel and Docker container are not compromised, it's secure. You can also send file descriptors over Unix sockets. That's using the insertion data just, just uh, glue on also the capsule. So these features are, for example, used in multiprocessing. And the standard library documentation, the socket middle has an example how to do that. The code is rather ugly, depends on operating systems. Yeah, I'm also planning to add that actually to the standard library socket model. Why is it useful to send a file descriptor between, from one process to another? That's very useful, for example, for sandboxing. There's a feature called seccomp, and the Linux kernel used by lots of programs where you put your process in the in sandbox, and the sandbox actually prevents the process from doing any kinds of forbidden um, syscalls. So you say this process is not allowed to create new processes, this person is not allowed to open any files, mess with other files, or create network connections. But, okay, if you have like a uh, SSH connection or a, a browser, of course you want to like talk to another web server, there comes in the so-called broker. So you have another process that's very, very simple, uh, can be audited and checked for issues very much, much better than like a flash or a very complex browser renderer or video renderer. So 
the sandbox of the broker, please open that file for me. And the broker then opens the file and sends back the file descriptor. Or in case the process is compromised and does something evil, and the broker is able to just kill the malicious uh, instance and yeah, you're safe. And a couple of other topics I'd really, really like to cover here, uh, but a bit out of time. Yeah, like 30, minutes, 30 seconds left before the question and answer starts. Uh, memory map AO. So you can actually do more than just reading from a file. You can map a file into memory. It's very efficient if you have like multiple processes open the same file, uh, or doing random reads and writes. The kernel actually copies data from the file into the memory and removes that eventually. Um, NumPy has a wrapper for that. There's something very new called memory FD, where you can actually create a file-like thingy in memory that you can seal. So you can basically write data, seal the box, nobody can change the data anymore, and then give this file descriptor to another process. Uh, it's a better way to do temporary files. Um, you can do much more efficient I.O. with zero copying. So every time you copy data from the kernel into the user space and back in the kernel space, if you have a contact switch which is really slow, you have copy data multiple times. There are better ways to do that, like send file. Python used it already. Copy file range that's going to be added to Python 3.6. Splicing, a very new thing where you have actually an uh, SSL TLS socket that is very useful for high performance file servers. They do most of the uh, expensive TLS inside the kernel itself. And finally, event-driven IO, so the features that are used for async OO, where you have like hundreds of connections or thousands of connections, and you use these kinds of commands to well, kind of wait, and uh, every time the pipe is ready for reading and writing, so connection is ready for, ready for reading and writing, um, the process gets informed of that. So async OO uses that. If you want to know more about file descriptors or want to talk about it about uh, the Custodia protocol uh, and proof of concept I am currently researching, please come to my open table at 4 o'clock today. It's in room C120 um, downstairs. So, thank you very much. And. Ah, almost in time. So, three minutes left for questions. Our question, what about change route? Change route? Yeah. Can you please go through the microphone? So the, it, over there. All right. Um, oh, sorry. This yeah. might be a bit germane uh, to the topic at hand, but uh, sorry. If I start up Red Hat, I open Python 3, and I open a file with a non Unicode character in the string. It, can you speak up a bit? I'm sorry. Red Hat time to understand you. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, I have a blank Red Hat Linux running. I start Python 3. I open a file, and in the file name, there's a non Unicode character. What happens? What do I have to care about? Like, would that okay. always work? That's actually not covered by, that's already handled by Python internally. That's not related to file descriptors. And Python tries to use uh, something called surrogate pairs to kind of translate bytes that are not matched to UTF-8 into something, yeah. I'm not an expert on that part of encoding, um, but that's actually not handled by anything with the kernel or syscall that's handled in Python. Because on Unix, files are actually bytes, but Python tries to do that as text, yeah. Uh, there's nobody? Okay, turn the other side again. Hello, sorry for shouting earlier. Thank you for the talk. Um, my question is, uh, uh, you said you can pass um, Unix sockets between containered, container, containerized processes, um, but often containerized processes have a ch root, right? They have a different view of what the file system is, so I wonder how that could work. Uh, yeah, that works. You can uh, create a file-based 
Unix socket. So if your Unix socket is like a file in a file system, and then you can mind, mind bind that directory into a, another container. It even works when you uh, mind bound the container read only, uh, that prevents the process from replacing or removing the file descriptors. Uh, because the file descriptor actually is a bit like a device file, so stuff you have in a dev directory, you can open that file and read and uh, connect to the file descriptor. What's currently not working is if you have uh, one container that creates a file descriptor, another container that wants to open the file descriptors, because uh, the MCS labeling prevents you from exchanging the information between unrelated containers. You either have to use some settings to put them in the same context, or what's, um, that's something that's going to be handled by kernel dbus. So kernel dbus are like Unix sockets on steroids with additional features where you also can do like this cross-container communication in a different way. Okay, so is the short answer that I have to bind mount a uh, common directory to both containers? Yes. Yep. And if you, uh, it's basically it's easier to use the broker approach. So you have like a super privileged container uh, that's running in the host pit namespace and create the file descriptor and all other containers then connect to that. So uh, the container example I wrote for Custodia actually is a privileged container uh, with the host namespacing because it doesn't currently work with the yes, Linux for security reasons, for a good security reasons. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That, that's all the time we have for questions, but remember Christian's open space at 4 p.m. Thank you.